Dear participants and experts, welcome to the post lunch session. I welcome our esteemed expert, Dr. Abhishek Appaji, Assistant Professor of Department of Medical Electronics, BMS College of Engineering, Bangalore. He has done his PhD from Maastricht University, Netherlands, holding two master degrees from Vishweshwarya College of Engineering and Karnataka State University and bachelors from medical electronics from BMS College of Engineering. He has filed two patents and has more than 45 research paper to his credit. He has won numerous awards and has completed more than 10 consultancy and funded projects in his area of research. I request Dr. Abhishek to kindly start the session. Over to you, sir. You can start the session now. Yeah, thank you, Professor Pooja. I hope you are able to hear me fine. Yes, sir. Complete. The volume is too low, sir. Sorry for interrupting you. Is it too low? OK. It's perfect uh, now. Yeah, audible. You can see my screen, is it? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so, good afternoon to all the faculty members, participants present here, as well as the organizers. Thank you for the opportunity given to me to share my knowledge in the field of medical image processing and computational neuroscience. So, what is that we are going to do today is uh, in specific, we are going to talk about a uh, um, little bit introduction about computational neuroscience, how it evolved and uh, some of the image processing work which I've done in computational neuroscience, as well as some generic image processing. So I am uh, basically a biomedical engineer. Uh, I'm currently working as the institutional coordinator for R&D at BMS College of Engineering, uh, as well as assistant professor in medical electronics engineering department at uh, BMSE Bangalore. Also the guest faculty at Maastricht University in Netherlands, and I have various portfolios as volunteering uh, in uh, IEEE. So I'll be sharing some of my experience uh, in, in the field of cognitive neuroscience. But uh, uh, before that, I'll introduce you a little bit about cognitive neuroscience, how the term evolved, followed by some of my research work. Then again, we'll switch the gaze back to cognitive neuroscience, some of the research work which I've done in the field. Uh, so if you see what is cognition, cognition is uh, mental abilities and processes related to it can be knowledge, attention, memory, reasoning and computing. So it's basically anything which is related to your brain. What you are trying to do right now, you are listening with attention. Hopefully that is again related to cognition. Uh, the knowledge which you are gaining, the memory which, it, which will store in your uh, the brain and reasoning you're telling that you have signed up for this workshop that's again you're giving reason and then signing up computing various processing calculations everything is comes uh, everything comes under cognition uh, so this was first coined the term cognition was first coined by two experts uh, george and michael in the year 1976 way way long back and later uh, then they were uh, ma majorly in the 19th century, they were trying to do something on localization views, that is individual areas of the brain. What is the view of the brain as well as anatomically as well, uh, and also uh, physiologically or the functionality of it, they were trying to understand. Then they were trying to see the field view. Neuropsychology was also another one, uh, Borka's area at that time, uh, which was responsible for a lot of activities related to neuropsychology. That was also uh, done at that time. And uh, mapping of the brain was done by again two of the scientists to understand how can we generalize the brain for entire world or entire community of people uh, who are living in this uh, world. Uh, then came 20th century, a new concept known as neuron doctrine, which means that each of the neurons, what you can see, this was done in uh, 1952 or something. So uh, how does each neuron uh, are contributing to the brain activity that that way they called as neuron doctrine. So it's not about one single 
organ which is working though brain is one single organ but inside it there are multiple subsystems and neurons which is actually trying to work then they come up, came up with the revised brain mapping or new brain mapping techniques uh, to correlate with how the structure as well as functional part of the imaging of the brain can happen at this time they came up with a new term which is known as cognitive neuroscience so neuroscience is a field of neurology or you know brain which is uh, you are understanding how the brain works uh, the it can be uh, majorly the structural part of the brain and uh, another one was cognitive that is cognition which you have learned just now so how the knowledge the memory the reasoning so on so forth is working so combining this they came up with a term known as cognitive neuroscience so why do you need this cognition or cognitive neuroscience is basically to understand insights into area of cognition whether the cognition is Uh, the insight is good or uh, uh, how which part is responsible for right now i'm talking so which part is actually getting uh, alerted in the brain so all those parts so you are doing some calculations you are doing some uh, theoretical mathematics or doing practical mathematics or application based so everything there is a region in the brain which is responsible it can distinguish between different theories related to brain working so we uh, previously some of the scientists used to say brain is to work this way because of this possibility later somebody came and said no no that's not the way this is the way this is what is happening so all those things uh, later people got a uh, little bit of more clarity still there is a lot of things which brain has to be explored but they got more clarity when they came and they talked about uh, different um, theories related to brain working of course uh, you know uh, nowadays everything is trending uh, i'm sure there are some more other speakers who are covering something related to artificial intelligence and machine learning or deep learning anything related to uh, the field of biomedical engineering so here also uh, it's nothing but they are trying to mimic the brain that's why uh, the word artificial intelligence came up machine learning deep learning and so on so forth so again you need cognition or cognitive neuroscience to understand how ai ml can work how your machine can work the way uh, humans are working next is mimic human ability so whatever we are doing that's what is ai ml so how cognition we can study in different parts so i'll i'll be discussing in brief about each one of them uh, you might have already be comfortable with few of them at least so psychophysics is one of the field where we see the physics of uh, psychology or psychiatry and things like that electroencephalography is another one where we take some signals from the brain and analyze i'll talk about it in my next few slides fmri is functional magnetic resonance imaging this is also another part where we try to do some kind of activities uh, Uh, try to understand how the functional part of the brain uh, comes into picture electrocorticography it's kind of invasive technique to find out uh, uh, it's 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 mimicking of electroencephalography but taking the uh, individual neurons or group of neurons what is the activity they are trying to next is tms transcranial magnetic stimulation so we'll see few of them so first one is uh, psychophysics the study scientific study of relation between stimulus and sensation so you give some stimulus what is the sensation what is the physics involved what is the uh, brain uh, working involved and so on so forth we try to do that so usually this is seen in terms of magnitude or the difference so you give some stimulus what is the difference it comes so you, you would have heard of a term known as action potential which is very common in biomedical field where you give some stimulus the action potential goes to positive and again it comes down right so that's uh, that way if you remember so this kind of analysis we call it as psycho physics electrocorticography is uh, here uh, we see the uh, it's more an invasive way where they do the surgery and open a part of the brain put some uh, electrodes at different different position and try to understand what activities are happening so it's practice of using electrodes placing directly to exposed surface so they chop off little bit of brain skin and then try to put the sensors and try to do it it's not completely too deeply invasive but uh, it's enough invasive to call it as invasive so uh, they'll take out little bit of the skull and then uh, try to put something and then each they'll be divided into different grids uh, uh, something similar to 1020 uh, electrode configuration which we'll see in the next slide 
and then they'll see sensory area motor area and uh, different different areas of the brain and try to understand which is uh, responsible for what again this will be in terms of signals which will be in either millivolts or microvolts most of the time microvolts but because we are taking directly if the stimulus is very strong we can also get in millivolts uh, next is uh, tms transcranial magnetic stimulation so what we do here is it's non invasive which means that you don't put anything or you don't chop anything there's no blood uh, uh, business here so what you do is you just put a electro uh, you just take uh, one one machine what you can see in the diagram is you just take uh, one of the part here in the machine uh, which is a huge machine in that part of it is taken where they give some kind of uh, magnetic stimulation some kind of magnets where the brain gets stimulated and then gives you some of the signals and it can be used for a specific part of the brain by just placing different parts of uh, your uh, the so basically you take the part and then put it uh, different places and so that you can get some kind of analysis this is very interesting there's a lot of research which is happening in a field known as electroencephalography eg it's a recording of electrical activity of scalp which means that there's no invasion max to max what people do is they just uh, take out the hairs or they also do with the hairs many of the time and taking different parts of the brains so the one which you see in the figure is kind of uh, 128 electrodes maybe so we use 1020 configuration for this to place the electrodes to find out what activity is happening at each of them so one of the common problem why we take electroencephalography is the noise because it's so minute signal that your noise is even having more power than your actual signal so the signals will be in microvolts so you use different techniques like uh, uh, filtering uh, independent component analysis principal component analysis to analyze how you can find out in each of these part of the brain what kind of activities are happening so you do give some stimulus and find out what activity is happening in the brain using some signals so this are some of the uh, different free based on the frequencies it's like if it is very less frequency like the one which you can see in the last you call it as delta where there is very sleepy and dreaming uh, like if i take you in uh, uh, dreams if i take some signal so there is something as sleep lab which many of the universities have or the hospitals have where they do analysis overnight how they are able to uh sleep properly or what is that they are trying to do you don't know what dream they are doing but you will get in at least they are very sleepy or they are dreaming if you are drowsy it will be theta alpha beta and gamma so i have a better picture for you to show so it is divided in terms of hertz uh, how many hertz you know clinical significant frequency of electroencephalography eg is between 0 to around 100 hertz or maybe around 70 80 hertz so in that more important is uh, when people do kind of alpha wave analysis and so on and so forth so delta waves has 0.5 to 4 hertz which means that it will take very less time uh, and uh, it will take more uh, so one by uh, less frequency which means more time right one by um, uh, f is t so delta waves is 0.5 to 4 hertz whereas uh, where a person is in deep sleep if he is meditating state or hypnosis state then theta waves you will get 4 to 7 hertz relax alerted or light meditative state you get alpha waves where they are alert so right now if you see i may be having beta waves you may be having alpha waves or maybe someone may have delta waves if i are deep sleeping by just switching on the system so we don't know so next is beta waves 13 hertz to 30 hertz and the last one is uh, uh, if you are doing very very vigorous activity and uh, you're trying to think something you have very stress with the time and you want to do something and uh, within the time and your brain is taking lot of power and energy and oxygen to do something that is called as gamma waves so different waves based on frequencies we divide into different parts next one very important one which i have also worked a little bit is functional mri functional mri is functional magnetic resonance imaging or fmri so uh, it's also called as functional mri so mri if you take just mri which is magnetic resonance imaging it gives the structure of your brain which means that how much is the size how is the bifurcations or uh, you know the uh, structure at each part of the brain if you slice it how will it look and so on and so forth that's that structural mri which is usually called as mri 
there is another part which is known as functional mri functional mri is how the function is happening of the brain so when i am talking there is one part of the brain which is functioning very actively compared to other parts of the brain so that you can know by a technique known as functional mri that is fmri functional neuroimaging procedure it is it uses the same mri technology but that additional things because you may have to give stimulus uh you may have to do something at all so if you don't give any stimulus we call it as resting state mri rs mri or r mri where the patient or the individual or the subject is just sleeping doing nothing he's just resting and then you are taking some mri we call it as resting state fmri if you are giving some stimulus for example you tell that move your finger and i'll take fmri or you start talking i'll take fmri uh if you see uh, fmri the problem is the spatial resolution is very 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 bad whereas time resolution is good so it again depends on lot of factors why you need to choose fmri versus eeg eeg time resolution is good but here uh, spatial resolution is uh, good so it all depends on how which modality you work on and it measures the activity by detecting associated change in uh, flow so it's called as bold which is blood oxygen level dependent so if i am talking right now what part of the brain gets maximum oxygen then you will get different colors here based on the color you can say that here there is a maximum oxygen here there is very less oxygen that's why the color is different so it's again color bar red is more active blue is less active yellow is in between something like that so bold is one of the technique which is used in fmri this is again very uh, hardcore research which started 20 30 years back and now people are on hype doing lot of research in related to this only thing is access to these machines uh if you have a special research lab only for doing your research that's amazing if not you have to wait in the clinical setting and try to see if uh, you can get access so getting an access to these kind of expensive super expensive machines is tough so we compromise with eeg where you get the signals uh, rather than doing for image so if you remember i showed you one of the picture let me go back to that picture yeah so this is a picture which was done by mose ojal in 1952 he is from um, uh, spain in madrid madrid in spain so here uh, the same guy uh, he gave one very nice quote i thought i'll use it as long as our brain is a mystery the universe the reflection of the structure of the brain will also be a mystery so he told in 1921 later he came up with amazing uh, brain uh, further computations brain doctrine and so on and so forth now a small activity to check if your guys are listening me is what are the applications so let's come to image processing in generic and then we'll go and in depth into we'll go to different medical image processing so from now onwards i'll be talking only about what all projects i was involved in what all projects have done what are the uh, things you can think of in the same direction so what is the major application of image processing i guess the chat button is enabled for you guys so you can go ahead and chat and say uh what are the applications of image processing you can just put one word two words or something so somebody says tumor detection disease diagnosis at the earliest stages wow i see we have almost 80 90 participants so let's hear from at least few of them to say why do you need image processing so one of them is biomedical where you are giving answer saying disease detection diagnosis tumor detection that's really good but you can also talk about some of the non biomedical application why do you need image processing do you use image processing in day to day life face detection wonderful yeah pattern detection pattern detection okay segmentation feature selection noise filtering robotics wow yeah gone gone if you have that communication can you repeat it and okay finger... biometrics yeah yeah fingerprinting uh, fingerprint uh, technologies and so on and so forth yes restoration crack detection okay what else deep learning okay fine we have got pretty decent number of answers so uh, 
image processing you see day to day life what you are doing from your eyes is image processing i would say you zoom in zoom out that's your eyes is like camera where you zoom in if you want to see something uh, very far you can uh, use uh, your um, eyes to zoom in and find out what if you are able to see though there is not much of control there's lot of things happening in your eye i'll talk a lot of things about my research in related to retinal image processing very soon but uh, if you see i remember one of the very famous projects which uh, i remember is uh, coming up with something known as uh, uh, related to uh, somebody said crack detection i saw somewhere yes that's a very much of industrial application many of the materials especially if you see aerospace or any such kind of materials you see that there are uh, places where they do crack detection even a small crack can destabilize the entire system and uh, it can the stability or the strength of the system can reduce there is another part like say if you remember monuments like um, uh, say you are in uh, ahmedabad so you 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 know you had this uh, wonderful statue of unity around uh, uh, ahmedabad i know participants are there from all over india but because the host college is ahmedabad let's take example of statue of unity uh, if when they are doing that if there is some kind of uh, uh, image processing you can do it you can maybe recognition finding the strength of the entire thing and also see for example 1000 years down the line if there is one part of the uh sardar vallabhbhai patel statue is little uh, distorted then you can use image processing and replicate it or take char minar you know uh, taj mahal or you take india gate gateway of india all those places wherever you go you see that it is self replicating if you know one side you can replicate the other side that's perfect example of image processing the mobile phones which you are using day to day that's also image processing you are trying to zoom in zoom out you are trying to do some filters to put on your instagrams your stories your whatsapp everything is image processing uh let's also switch gaze to a little bit different that is if you go to satellite there is lot of images coming and you you have access to many of the images which means public repository there you take do some image processing your drone you are using again there is lot of image processing so image processing is there in all the fields literally every field you want to work but it has been dominated in a field known as biomedical engineering so biomedical image processing is really good and we'll see that it's uh, really very uh, dominant in that place so this uh, i'm not sure how to play video on this uh, are you able to hear if you can tell me i'll just play it and let me know are you able to hear can someone acknowledge me no 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 sir. we are not able to hear you sir okay so i have i was anticipating this so what we can do is uh, there is one subtitles at the bottom so this is one of the challenge for you guys and uh, i want all of you to be very very active and look at your screen uh, at each and every point what you are getting on the screen that is the video which i am playing so what is your task is you should identify what is that things got changed or what are the changes you can observe in this slide because change is very important and uh, what are the things we humans can actually check and find out if you know image processing so we humans can uh, if you have read image processing if you have taught or if you have understood there are 255 colors right 0 to 250 in that humans can see only half of the colors which means that if i see what is 254 and 255 gray level i can't differentiate it at the naked eye so you should have at least half of the colors is what we will differentiate but computer can do better than us so having said that in this one of the challenge for all of you is please look at this and tell me what are the changes you will find out when i stop the video till then you can note down in your brain or write down somewhere so i'll play this video don't worry about audio there is a subtitles which is coming at the bottom you can check and you can see that
Okay, uh, so were you able to see some of the changes in this video? So let me... Probably image quality is improving. Okay, that's not uh, what I wanted you to answer. So uh, let me show the video again. The color of the, the color, the quote, uh, color of the detective is changing. Okay, color of the detective change. I mean, quote from what gray else? to, yeah. Color of detective's quote got changed. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Anything else like that did you see? So I'll just show you the video here. So did you see anything the, like this? Sir, the color of the pant of the dead body has also changed. Okay, I would say the dead body itself changed. I'll show you how. Here, yeah, yeah is maybe. standing behind that girl is turned into a soldier. Ah, okay. Very good, very good. Some more answers? What uh, else got uh, changed? Yes, ma'am. The, the, I think so, the vessel which she's having in her hand, the direction of the vessel is also changed. Okay, direction is fine. I would have moved. That's fine. But is, did the vessel... The color has become changed? more brighter, more brass color. Maybe the vessel only got changed. Anything else? Yeah. And I the dead body got changed. Uh, yeah, the in the second image, it, uh, the leg was lifted up half of Yeah, so I say that the dead body itself changed. I'll show you. I know you will start uh, laughing. I see color change, all those things. Bear got changed. Yes, flower pot got changed. Yes. So I want you to answer in the chat window how many number of changes you saw. So now if we count the number of changes, what you guys have told, maybe five. 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, 200, 300,000. So how, how many numbers it got changed? Can you put that number, type that number on the chat window, please? Is it 5, 10, 20? How many numbers, uh, how many such changes happened? Three changes, okay. Dr. Sanjeev have observed three changes. That's amazing. Any other people have uh, found more than three? Okay, I see Samira has found four. Just put it in your mind, rewind the video. I'll show that all the changes, what you can see. It's it's more number of changes than what you have thought. Four changes, okay, five. Only five, seven, okay, the number is going on. So I'm doing kind of auction now. Whoever tells the maximum number, they will win. Six, okay. The color of the flower pot was also changed. Okay, fine. So let's go back to the slide and see what changed actually. I will fast forward it till where we had stopped. So we stopped till here, right? So I'll play the entire video. The number of changes is 21 changes. You want to know what are that? So watch this video. Yeah. Might be the cap, the cover. See, 21 changes. You just see what are those changes. Lady, lady flower. See, the dead body got changed. The no, clock no. got changed. The carpet that got was changed. The lady was having this. The pot got changed. She got a different pot. Dead body got changed. A new no, person that's has right. The flower pot had changed. Okay. One, two, three, four. So this video is available on uh, uh, YouTube. You just see maybe I can share the link for you guys. You can share this. Uh, you can see this later. Uh, gain and count if it is correct or wrong. So I put on the chat window. You can see that later, not now. So uh, this is what, why I showed this video is uh, something very important. Your observation is very important. You should be also equally observant and you can train your machine saying you be observant so that your image crossing will be successful. 
Fine. So these are some of the teasers of my talk. So let me start off with uh, some of the projects which I've done, which are related to image processing or biomedical engineering in particular. And then I'll switch gears back to cognitive neuroscience, where I've done some of the projects related to cognitive neuroscience and published some of the papers. So this is one of the award which I, which uh, me and one of my students received at uh, Gandhi and Technological Innovation Award. So what was this project? Was uh, we were taking some of the um, when I, I actually, this Srishti is in Ahmedabad, uh, so I'd come a couple of times and also presented in IMM, IMM Ahmedabad also. So uh, if you see uh, a mother when she's about to deliver a baby, they'll have some of the problems that is uh, uh, the doctor has to decide is it the right time, is the stress level enough for the doctor to deliver either by cesarean or by normal delivery or is it the right time to take some of the decisions. So this is one of the projects which we had done where uh, we had one nice uh, a belt kind of thing where it will, it will count number of contractions, duration of contractions, uh, the fetal heart rate and everything. And we converted this into a device which, oh, I didn't put the picture of the device, but it was a nice fancy device which looks like ultrasound, uh, handheld ultrasound. And it used to give the number of uh, some numbers related to both mother and baby. Uh, this is another project which we concluded uh, a year back is on uh, smart eye cures for community screening. We got some funding from Singapore government and it was tripartite agreement between Tentoxin Hospital, BMSC and Nanyang Technological University. So this one had complete image processing. So this is a machine which takes the images of the eye. So I take my image of the eye both anterior and posterior. Anterior is nothing but the one which I see in my eyes, that is what you're able to see in my eyes right now, is the front part of the eyes. Posterior is a back part of the eyes. So we have a screen at the back of the eyes, which is known as retina. So both these images, and it used to give refraction measurement, which can tell me how much is the glasses I should wear and interpret the distance between two pupils. So this is majorly for people who are going down. Uh, in the in the uh, in, not in the remote people because it's completely automated where there is no intervention of a man or woman who can do the screening. So if you're wearing specs, you would know there is a person standing at that side. You have to sit here and then they'll check your eyes and they'll tell you, okay, this specs, this not specs, this is some problem. You have to get it examined and so on and so forth. This one is completely automated. So this was the machine which we built initially the inside of it and finally it converted itself into a machine of this kind what you are seeing right now on the screen but we used to call this as white elephant because this was really huge and things like that but this is what is the uh, limitation of academic institutions so we want to productize it so we partnered with one of the industry and then uh, uh, i mean actually it is spin off from this for this product it's called uh, uh, one of the, the machine is Atoyos is the company and this is a machine iRobo where they have uh, uh, completely automated everything what we had done. It's a replication and they have also added virtual reality. So we are still continuing the research based on this and uh, it's one of the machine which is in clinical trials right now and will be in market very soon. Another one is uh, again image processing dominantly is uh, one of the problem which uh, we face in Bangalore, a city like Bangalore, I'm sure you would have seen in many of the cities in India is, uh, any idea what side we drive in Bang in India? Is it left side or right side? Any of you can answer, unmute and answer. Left. Okay, left side. Uh, so you're very fortunate if people are driving on the left side, but in cities like Bangalore, where people are crazy because it's too populated and too uh, traffic, so we drive on left, right, and center, irrespective of wherever you are. So to tackle this kind of problem, uh, what will happen to that if we don't follow traffic rules is we end up with an uh, accident, and accident is so common. Uh, people used to die with accidents, now people are dying with COVID. So it's so common as much as what we are talking. Uh, so this is not only common in a city like Bangalore, but many other metropolitan cities and other kind of cities also have this kind of problem. So to tackle that, we thought, can we come up with a portable X-ray or easy to use X-ray machine? So we came up with a machine, which was again funded by DST, Department of Science and Technology, uh, for us to come up with a machine which has a uh, very interesting uh, concept where instead of, if you see X-ray machine, why we need X-ray machine is to find out if a bone or any other parts, uh, hard parts in the body has gone wrong, dismantled, cut, or 
changed any of its uh, uh, structure and things like that. So we came up with the machine where instead of having a conical way of exposure, which is a traditional X-ray machine, we came up with a line exposure or the point blank. That is one single point we used to take the exposure. So with this regard, uh, we actually came up with a, a machine which we do focused way and we used to change the uh, source and detector. It used to travel on X and Y zone and then we used to capture the images. So we used to take those images and stitch that in software, which was very easy. So we had, uh, we gave this technology to, oh, so this was a machine, what you can see on the screen is a machine uh, which we had and it has only drawback of this was, though we claimed it to be portable, it was kind of semi-portable, I would say, and it used to give only extremities, which means that the accidents which involve some of the parts of hands or legs, which is broken, then that can be diagnosed on the fly. So ultimately, we wanted to put this in the ambulance. Now we have given this to industry to further develop and bring it as a product. So we got some of the awards for this and so on and so forth. So another project which uh, uh, which I had done, so my PhD was from Netherlands at that time, one of the trip I'd gone for hacking elderly care. So we worked on um, one of the facilities on virtual reality, you know, Unity and uh, such softwares is something very prominent nowadays for gaming as well as also in healthcare. So how we are using one of the applications which we did was uh, for rehabilitations, uh, uh, amputes with the phantom uh, limb pain. For example, if you see this diagram, what they are trying to do is they do something known as mirror therapy, which means that they put the hand on the other side and they try to stab one virtual hand and they'll try to take out. So this will give them, so this phantom limb, somebody whose limbs are cut, for them the pain will be uh, pseudo pain, which means that they won't be able to, uh, uh, it's more of psychological rather than physical pain. The physical pain would have gone over after a few days, the body would have got adjusted, the brain wouldn't have got adjusted. So we came up with uh, one of the device where uh, instead of that, they can use virtual reality and then they can do some kind of training of the brain rather than using the mirror therapy, which you can see in the animation on the screen. Okay, so uh, this is another one which we did with University of Technology, Sydney. So one of the brain, uh, brain signal processing uh, job which we had done was, a major problem if you see, uh, this was done actually, it's between multiple people. So the professor had dual operation from uh, Taiwan as well as in UTS Sydney. So he got the experimentation done in Taiwan and the actual other analysis was done by me and my professor in uh, UTS Sydney. So uh, what we did was, uh, uh, instead of, uh, I guess, yeah. So this involved a lot of very um, complicated system where we designed, change the entire car where, I'm sorry, yeah, where we change the entire car, you can see both the side view as well as back view where we had some cameras which was put in and we had some signal processing EEG n bio device uh, uh, to take the physiological parameters like electroencephalography in particular. And then whenever a person changes from one lane to another, we used to take the response, how much time he will take to change from one lane to another. So if you want from right to left, how much time you will take? And after that, how much... Uh, uh, reaction time and how much stress you are feeling are uh, changing because uh, uh, you'll be going in high speed so how will you change and things like that. So we came up with one of the analysis using that and we published a couple of papers in IEEE Access uh, on this uh, uh, result. So you can check that paper for in, in detail. It's available online and it's open access. So another one we did uh, re related to again brain was uh, uh, easy signals for different emotions using PCI. So we made uh, people, we took around 25 subjects. We showed them some of the animations where they had to feel very happy, that to feel very sad, they have to feel very fearful. We used and then we tried to do some kind of analysis. And uh, this is still, uh, we took, we, part of it is already published. I'll talk about it in some time. So this is another project in biometrics. Somebody was talking about image processing application of biometrics. Can we use 
EEG, uh, sorry, ECG as biometric. So we found that yes, we can use it. But when we combined with a couple of them, then it became very better that we use uh, both uh, the fingerprint as well as iris and EEG. The ECG, then it's better. ECG is electrocardiography, uh, where you take the signals from the heart and then try to do some analysis. Uh, we also did uh, some of the things in ultrasound images where we had pediatric cardiac ultrasound uh, images despeckling. Uh, so this was one more interesting project which we did was along with Stanford University, uh, Lucille Packet Children Hospital, part of uh, Stanford University. We had a professor there whom we collaborated. So we used three different image compression techniques, singular value decomposition, discrete cosine transform and discrete wavelet transform. So when we use this, we got to know that uh, the uh, there was a lot of uh, changes in terms of what clinician can read it. So what we did was we asked the clinician to read these images and give us some feedback if uh, it is good or bad. So we found that one of the algorithm worked very well. So the innovative thing in this is we went to 10 different clinicians, asked them, this is original image, this are compressed image. Do you see clinically significant parts which you, which as a doctor, do you think all this you can see? Yeah. And uh, we got very good results also. This was one of the uh, projects which we had done called Mild Slave Robo. One of our students had done this. So what uh, was done is uh, if you blink once, you used to know that uh, uh, it will go right. If you blink twice, it will go left and so on and so forth. Uh, later, it went just the thinking. So there was one group of project. Uh, uh, I haven't put that, I guess. So there's another group of project where they just think about going left, left, left. It used to go left or concentrate on one point, it used to go on left or right, something like that. So this is what the stress analysis I was talking about. So we did that stress analysis of game player using electroencephalogram. So we did two kind of uh, uh, racing games and first person shooter, and we got uh, good uh, uh, results, and which is also published in one of the conferences. Yeah, so from now onwards, I'll be talking a little bit of retinal image processing, which was part of my PhD, as well as other works which I've done in collaboration with hospitals. One thing if you see in common is, which is very important for all of you to take away in uh, our, uh, uh, in, in all the talks rather, if you have seen majority of the work is usually done in collaboration with our uh, hospitals or doctors. Okay, you usually don't do it uh, individually by yourself. You should always collaborate with doctors so that you get the real problem and you solve the real problem. So this is in collaboration with Tentox and Hospital in Singapore. So what the images, what you're looking looks like uh, something which you may not understand, but these are nothing but OCT, optical coherence tomography images, where it is the retinal image where you, if you slice your retina and you will find different layers, what you see here. So we worked on these layers and especially the, uh, the area which you see at the bottom, we wanted to find out how much black and white part of there. So that will give, that may be different in patients versus what it can be in the normal people. So this is what we tried to do. Uh, yeah, I will skip these things. This is, I'll come back to again, maybe the, my slides are a little shuffled. But this is also another interesting project which we did long back in 2011, uh, where at that time machine learning, deep learning and all was just emerging. So here, one interesting problem I would like to tell you here is uh, the doctor came to us and said, uh, listen, the problem here is whenever we try to uh, do kind of uh, you know, endoscopy, we are getting images, we are seeing live images, and we have to wait for doctor to come and see. Instead of that, a paramedic can do endoscopy, store the images, later doctor come and scroll or, and tell that, okay, this person has this kind of disorder, so I have to treat him this way. So what we did was we just took the existing machine, put one in between image grabber, and it started storing a lot of images. So problem is solved that uh, the doctor can do offline uh, study of the patient images. They came up with another problem saying, hey, listen, yes, you have done this uh, one, but can you help us in organizing those images? Because we have got like each patient around 5,000, 2,000 or 10,000 images, the number of uh, times you take. So can you help us with this? So what we did was 
uh, we help them in uh, doing uh, some kind of management of the images into different categories. We use basic name-based algorithm, which at that time was existing and famous. So a cancer or polyp or tumor or early cancer, uh, late cancer and things like that, we just classified it and gave it to them. Uh, so this is another part. In the retinal image, you go in depth and you go in terms of very mi micro resolution and you want to identify each vessel in the retina. So that is nothing but adaptive optics you can use. So we took the ratio of uh, uh, something known as AO wall to lumen ratio, adaptive optics wall to lumen ratio. So what wall you can see and what lumen you can see that is black and white in this image, that ratio will be different for patients and uh, normal people like us. But problem is these machines are time expensive. So fortunately I had collaboration with one of the hospitals and they helped me in giving that mission. Uh, another one which we did in adaptive optics is uh, uh, cone counting. So the one which you are able to see different colors on the screen or around you is because of rods and cones, right? So one is black and white, another one is colorful. So this cone is also important. So doctors wanted to know how many cones are there and uh, how the cones are spaced and so on and so forth. Uh, so the problem is the existing software which came up with the machine was not that uh, good for them to use. They told, can you add these, these things? So what we did was we took cone uh, density. Uh, we did Varnai analysis. Uh, so the, everything was built in MATLAB where we actually did Varnai analysis to find out what are the neighbors and who are their neighbors. Uh, next is auto segmentation of OCT layers. So if you remember the OCT images which I had showed, so it had different kinds of layers. Uh, so can we segment them in different different layers and find out what's the length and breadth? So this one we did it for macular edema, that is the swelling of eyes in simple terms. So there was difference between the normal patients and uh, patients with edema. So we took around 20 or 30 images of each and then find out that there was difference. Uh, another tool which we got was OCT Anjo, which is uh, uh, OCT and angiography together, optical coherence tomography and angiography, where they inject some dye inside the eyes, they literally put an uh, injection in the eye, and that dye will cross, go across the eye, uh, the retinal part of the eye, and it will pass through, and we take number of images based on that. So these images, they wanted to take one particular part, that is middle part, what you can see, and find out what is the uh, 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 area, gray level area, how much is the affected uh, pixel, how much is the total area, and so on. So we did a couple of uh, such analysis, and we got published in one of the very famous journals in ophthalmology, which is the British Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, so we did for, they wanted for 3 cross 3, they wanted for 6 cross 6. So all these problems which I'm talking is I got from doctors. Uh, this is again one more. If you see the left part of the eye, you can see this red part. This one is actually deoxygenated, which means that non-perfused area. Uh, there is less supply of oxygen here or no supply of oxygen. The oxygen supply to this part of the eye is gone. So it's, we call it as the ishmic area or ishmic index. So we, they wanted to come up how much percentage of the eye or the retina is gone. So we came up with the index for that. Another one is oximetry, like how you know pulse oximetry, you would have heard even in COVID times that oxygen saturation level goes down because you are not able to breathe well. Similarly, even in retina, you can find out how much oxygen level, we call it as retinal oximetry. So there again, it depends on the color bar where if there is a more oxygen, you see uh, arteries. If you have less oxygen, you see veins. How much percentage of oxygen we can try to do some analysis with respect to uh, normal people and patients. Tortio City is another one I'll talk about this a little later. This is another interesting one, uh, one of the projects which we have been doing from few years. Uh, batch by batch, so every set of students who join and work with me and my colleagues, so we keep on doing this project. So retinopathy of prematurity is one of the very important problem which we are trying to solve in the world. This 
retinopathy of prematurity is nothing but the babies who are born premature before 9 months in the mother's womb they uh, their retina grows in the last few months of their pregnancy so if the baby is born before the retina won't grow they'll form a ridge what you can see in the image here they form ridge and these vessels won't grow beyond those ridges okay it would be like a barrier for them for the retina vessels to grow so the there are different stages so if they come up in very early stage then it is treatable if they come in very late stage it's not treatable again uh, what their delivery and what time they were premature and so on and so forth so what uh, we did was we came up with uh, uh, a diagnostic tool to detect the criticality of retinopathy of prematurity so stage 1 and stage 2 it's okay it may get auto corrected because humans um, uh, god has created such a way that lot of problems it will solve within itself the regulation mechanism is amazing in the human body so it in case it goes to stage 3 stage 4 and all they have to follow up and they may have to get operated so that uh, they they can remove the ridges so we came up with some of the softwares and gave it to them and multiple publications came out of this so next is age related macular degeneration is uh, uh, again uh, this is how the vision looks so here if you see the normal uh, vision like what we are able to see and someone with amd that is armd or amd age related macular degeneration they see a black spot within and they see uh, just, and they see something like this but the good part of the human brain is it gets just the same my vision is like this by the time you understand that your vision you have lost it it will be too late and when you go to doctor you would say no no i am looking i can able to see but only when you try to see after few years then you will understand that the vision is completely gone or it is it's very tough to restore so for that the doctors wanted to count the number of exudates what you can see here or drusen sorry the white part which you can see in these images the small size the medium size large size based on that you can tell which stage of amd they are in. we had multiple publications in very good conferences and journals because of this so before we go further uh, we have some more time uh, so i have uh, the last part which i'll be talking about how uh, i related the retina and psychiatry uh, especially uh, patients with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder so before we go further i want uh, to know if any one of you have any questions or uh, anything to share uh, any questions related to whatever we have discussed till now so majorly what i wanted to tell is uh, we are here to i mean it's just about what are the different research work which we have done so it may trigger saying okay this point is really good and we can also try remember you are doing research which means that somebody has already done the search you are researching is you are just uh, uh, searching what already exists you are just adding delta point to the existing research yeah Hello. So, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Hello, this is uh, Professor Sujata from Velour Institute of Technology. Yeah, ma'am. Tell me, ma'am. Ah, uh, yeah, it's nice. You have given like a complete preview of the things which you have done in the last ten years, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like you have done your uh, bachelor's and master's in the medical related engineering, and then you have done in the master in PhD related with the retina, much I guess. Yeah, yeah. So the next yeah. few things which I'll discuss is my PhD research. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so uh, yeah. So basically, I belong to IT department completely, but I do some research in the case of the, using the image processing and then uh, earlier uh, detection of disease in the leaf and all those stuff. Okay. So okay. now my query is: you have said about so many data sets like EEG uh -huh. data set, ECG data set, and then OCT data set. So where can we get this data sets? in an uh, like now if you are going to write some work no when you are going to refer that a kegel or uh, uh, some other mm -hmm. repositories they github github kegel normally now data set we are getting from this side but uh, yeah. in the reviewer part they try to tell like whether it is an perfect one whether it is an authenticated one whether it is a real one so getting mm -hmm. the data set is very uh, very challenging in nature yeah so this is really a good question what you have asked to me so yeah. uh, one of the thing which we biomedical engineering especially if you are doing something on signal processing image processing and all so getting it uh, real data set is always a problem so uh, so how you can address yes you have uh, i guess there is also one more website which google came up very recently uh, google data set or something 
data as such like how you search your uh, um, i hope you are able to see my screen yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like how you search uh, uh, in google for something for data search also you can say some of the retina images something for example so if i put i'll get the list of data so this is really amazing tool which google have come up you previously used to search somewhere but you see you want oct you get it here many of them you have to just fill a form and say that i want to use this and all this sources once you download it you have to acknowledge uh, put it in your references which all our researchers yeah. will do yeah this is one okay. way of tackling the exact uh, uh, the problem hmm. with data set but hmm. all said and done because it's publicly available many of us would have already beaten to death which means yes. that all this images people have done if you go to yes, this website you would have find out to check for the papers or what which have been carried out and then only we have to touch this data sets obviously yeah yeah so yeah. already they would have done lot of work and you can come up with your own work but still it won't be novel and publications yes. will be very tough like latest so, data set we can take and go on with it yeah yeah so like, yeah yeah that's true yeah. latest we can take but still the problem is they would have already done some work and doing some novelty in that is problem so what all work which i showed one of the statements which i told time and again is collaboration is very important i'm sure yes. vit has very good collaboration with the yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. medical yes. school yes. and all so yes. even yes. others also uh, just go and collaborate with doctors it will it those days have gone when doctor says i don't want to talk to engineers now the doctors are so open that they are also become very research minded uh, so few of my research was done in collaboration with narayan netralaya you know narayan hospitals and then nimans national institute of mental health which i'll talk a little bit in next few slides all these things all the hospitals just collaborate with the doctors maybe one doctor may say that no i can't uh, collaborate go to the next doctor there is no dearth of doctor uh, especially who are research blind blind uh, if they have so this are couple of things which i can think of as of now the time is a problem for them professor <laughs> yeah yeah that's very true yeah time is problem but uh, somehow they will make time if they have some research uh, blend in their mind and i've seen many doctors all over the world they publish left right and center papers papers Yeah. yeah that culture is also growing very much in india yes sir. yes yeah. thank you thank you yeah, thank you thank you professor yeah. so, medical ethics is the problem i have uh, myself professor taruk das uh, from nitay subhashin jain college mm-hmm. so i have also contacted different hospitals but uh, yeah. now it is really time consuming for ethical committee passing the et- uh, uh, ethical committee and other several um, aspects are there and it's required to seek seven months or the sometime one years or sometime it's cancelled yeah After yeah very true sir yeah yeah i completely agree in our country it is happening yeah yeah so that's why whenever you go and talk to a doctor talking to a doctor who is independent practitioner may not be of much help rather than talk to a doctor who is affiliated to medical university as well so usually this universities will have hospital attached and all the students masters as well as bachelor students have to do their thesis if not bachelor at least masters pg students have to do their thesis so they have in house ethical committee so whenever i worked with the doctors uh, it's all say narayan nathra is a teaching hospital and uh, kims kempegowda institute of medical sciences in bangalore is a teaching hospital nimans is a teaching hospital it's a university i mean university national it's a, a very good premier and a very reputed university so these universities have everything uh, uh, in place so it's easier for you to uh, talk to the doctors who are already doing research so yeah it's it's not so easy as much as i am doing so it's over the 10 years have built that relationship and i'm trying to do my research but it's not as easy uh, yeah that's very true fine so we'll come back to some more questions if you have at the end of the session next 15 minutes or 20 minutes i want to spend on some of the things which i've done during my phd and after my phd so uh, this was my phd thesis so if you uh, if you are interested you can just google abhishek apaji phd thesis retina you will get the entire pdf for download it's uploaded in my university website uh, so rahul okay so someone is talking so can you please mute yourself it would be participants are requested to mute yourself please yeah. everybody please mute yourself 
Um, yeah. Sir, sir can you okay. please share your contacts? I am so interested to work with you, sir. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Even I am open for collaboration. I'll share it at the end of my my last slide is about my uh, contact, or you can just Google my name. You'll get my details. Nikalo Ram, sir, everybody needs. Thank you, okay. sir. Yogendra, sir, uh, can you please mute? Yogendra Agarwal ji. Yeah. Ah uh, yes, sorry, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, go further. Uh, so what did I do in my PhD is this. So you know, uh, retina and brain are connected, right? So we have this retinal images. So all these things, whatever I told till now, was my pre-PhD work. Few of them were during PhD also. Uh, but that didn't contribute to my thesis. But during my PhD, one thing uh, is brain is related to retina because there is common embryological origin. The way it is originated, the, because it's almost together, distance is very small to tell in layman's name. So it's more like eye is an extension of central nervous system. So even anatomy they share, physiology they share, immunology and autoregulation properties like the correction mechanism also it shares. So this uh, was something which I wanted to explore to find out if there is some relation which we can develop, especially in the patients, uh, psychiatric patients. So fortunately, I had one supervisor from National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences and he's my other supervisor, what you can see on my screen. So this is me and this is uh, one of my supervisor from Netherlands. So when we actually, uh, what we did was, this is my overview of uh, my thesis. So we have schizophrenia patients, we had bipolar patients, we had volunteers, healthy volunteers. And uh, what we did was we took some of the features which I'll discuss sometime uh, in my next few slides and tried to see if there is some difference between the psychiatry patients and normal people like us. Yes, I had to apply for ethical committee clearance in NIMATS, thanks to my guide who took care of majority of it. And also talking to psychiatric patients was not easy. We had patients, uh, uh, because these psychiatric patients, you know, bipolar disorder and uh, healthy world, bipolar disorder is something, uh, they'll have some kind of, uh, 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 you know, problems where uh, they'll be very super happy or they'll be very sad. So that's why it's called two poles bipolar. So they'll be super happy or they'll be super sad under depression or something. Even schizophrenia is also something similar. More problem was differentiating between schizophrenia and bipolar because they come in early age, almost like 18 to 30 years or something. So it's early stage and there's a lot of loss of productivity because of that for the nation as well as for an individual. So we went to the ethical committee and then we started working with the patients on schizophrenia, bipolar and healthy volunteers. We did detailed clinical evaluation. I'm not a clinician, but uh, uh, thanks to again, my supervisor who actually uh, helped me in identifying a clinician who can do the analysis. Because to classify a person as bipolar or schizophrenia or a normal, there is some kind of test not a test uh, with the submission, it's all about the assessment. That is, you, you ask them some questions, you ask their uh, uh, caregiver some questions and come up saying this person is uh, schizophrenic, this person is not, and so on. And we use non-mediatic camera, the one which you can see on the screen, to actually acquire, which means non-mediatic is you need not put any of the uh, drops in the screen. So some of the very interesting features which we took, this one is very common. You would have heard of retinal vessel caliber, which means that the width of the vessel. So what is the width of the vessel? Uh, what you can see uh, in the red is arteries. What you can see in the blue is veins. And we took in specific region to, uh, to find out what's the width of the vessel. And uh, interestingly, we found that this is this was one of my first paper which I published in my PhD where healthy volunteers had uh, the artery of healthy volunteers was larger or it was normal and schizophrenia and bipolar was lesser than the healthy. Whereas it was uh, reverse in average in veins. So the veins was higher or larger in patients than healthy volunteers. So this was one of the findings. We also controlled for a few of the features like uh, their body mass index, their blood pressure and so on and so forth so that there won't be any comorbidities. Another one, what we did was tortuosity. So tortuosity is, this was another paper where we, this is the normal vessels, what you can see on the top image. The one at the bottom is tortuous image, which means that it use, it's a, like a zigzag pattern to be simple. 
uh, here also we found that it is more in patients it's more zigzag though visually it was not so evidential but when we did mathematically or uh, did some processing we found that it was more evident uh, retinal fractal dimension is another one if you see self similar patterns so if i the, you would have seen many riddles like this find out how many number of triangles are there in this image so it's nothing but self similar patterns where it gets replicated again so similar kind we found with this is also done in retinal images where if there is more uh, patterns which is self similar then we call it as fractal dimension the retinal uh, vessels is getting self replicated so the one on the top is higher fractal dimension one on the lower is lower fractal dimension so here also the results is we found that in patients of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder they had more uh, fractal dimension higher fractal dimension compared to healthy patients this is one of the new feature which uh, uh, we found out there was only two papers from japanese uh, authors uh, which told about retinal vascular trajectory ours was the third paper uh, what is this is uh, nothing but what you can see here uh, the one which is in circles is nothing but the vessels and arteries we marked some of the points and we want we formed a parabola out of it these parabola uh, used to follow one equation like uh, a binomial equation uh, which is uh, x1 square by 100 plus x2 x plus c or something like a constant so that x1 square that is uh, uh, by 100 a into x1 square that constant a we wanted to find out if there is some difference when we plot a parabola interestingly we found very unique results and this got published without any revisions that was very surprising uh, healthy volunteers schizophrenia and bipolar it was following almost similar pattern like how we had for result caliber so there was flatter and wider retinal artery trajectory and steeper and narrow retinal venular trajectory so the parabola which used to form was different so this was really interesting publication which we did later we also added a little bit of machine learning for this and we found that uh, the accuracy was good but more interesting is one of the papers we found that yes it is good if we have for psychiatry more than 80% of uh, more than 80% accuracy it's good for uh, psychiatry applications so we found 86% for healthy versus schizophrenia not for healthy versus bipolar so we used svm we used uh, uh, ensemble back trees and so on as machine learning but ensemble back trees perform very well and the schizophrenia versus bipolar gave very good so this is what was more interesting for doctors because whenever they do some kind of screening schizophrenia and bipolar always they used to get confused so can we come up with a tool so this was one but one of the problem here was uh, it is not individual whenever we do modeling machine learning we do it for group but when we go for individual is when we we'll achieve success so that's what we are working after my phd so another thing which we did is this was another paper where we did bezel width and cognition so um, what was the cognition we showed some of the pictures of cards uh, and told them to press a key if they find the same card uh, as before if it is different card you have to press another key and that was one experiment another experiment we did was uh, um, uh, whenever a particular card comes you have to press a key if not different key things like that we did three four different experiments we did some calculations on how fast they will do it patients have it uh, how fast they will uh, uh, identify it and uh, how correctly they will identify if i show this card is it same as previous card then they press a button if it is different they press different button how fastly they are pressing the button and how accurately they are doing it they are identify correctly or not that is another one which we did both of them were interesting and we found as anticipated patients have reduced speed and accuracy so we got a comment saying the education might be a criteria because a patient he if he's uh, educated maybe more than a matriculate or uh, plus 2 or engineer then his obvious cognition will be there so we took their education years of education and also we compensated adjusted for this statistically still we found very good results for this and uh, we found some correlation between the width if you remember the retinal visual width and the memory test what we did this was a summary which we did and this is post my phd what we did was we took mri images and we wanted to see if there is some correlation within the brain structure because as you know the 
images, uh, uh, the gold standard for many of the brain related abnormalities is MRI. Right. So even for schizophrenia and bipolar patients also is MRI. So we wanted to see if we can use retina as a proxy for instead of MRI or give some kind of clues. So we found that it was negatively correlated. This is just uh, under review. It's not yet published, but we are sure it will be published in very good journal. It's under review now. So we found that there is correlation. Um, uh, between them and it is negatively correlated as anticipated. Uh, we individually took different different uh, parts of the image and we tried to do it and we got very good results for this. Uh, another one which we are trying to do, which I'm not put in my slide is uh, uh, the, recently we got a funded project uh, which is continuation of my PhD. So we are trying to do a first degree relatives of uh, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder because it's majorly a genes which is involved or genetic heredity uh, which is involved in changes in these abnormalities. So we wanted to check if uh, first degree relatives of schizophrenia or first degree of bipolar disorder, what are their chances in changes in the retinal uh, vessels or their retinal vascular features. So that's what we did. And uh, so with this, uh, I would like to uh, stop, but I'll maybe a couple of slides I made. Uh, so this was about a little bit of my PhD and post PhD work. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about issues in neural engineering. You know, cognitive neuroscience is something uh, we are talking about ethics. Uh, it's more about now COVID-19. That's the trending word right on Google or anywhere. At least one day once we used to say 100 times. Now it's reduced to at least 10 times in a day. We say COVID-19 or uh, coronavirus or things like that. So is it ethical to give vaccine which is not a proven so solidly with the efficiency of 80 percent 90 percent is it ethical but if you see number of deaths which are happening if you want to control you have to use it so that is ethics what we are talking about here if you see there is application of this cognitive neuroscience neural engineering and there are a lot of medical applications like one which i showed you as well as non-medical applications, which is sensory uh, augmentation, physical amplification, neuromarketing, education, telepresence, gaming, biometric, lie detection, no lie MRI, and so on and so forth. So one of the couple of things which I wanted to discuss is uh, neuromarketing. So looks like somebody has unmuted. Again, Yogendra Ji, Dr. Yogendra Agarwal. Uh, yes, sir. sorry, actually, uh... Yeah, so uh, one of the thing which uh, uh, I want to tell is about uh, neuromarketing. Why neuromarketing? It's one of the trending field, though I'm sure it won't get any such kind of approval soon. So Uh, so uh, what is uh, uh, neuromarketing is, uh, for example, you come to, uh, you go to a mall, you don't know what to buy, you, you know what to buy, I'll just scan your brain and then come up and say that, hey, this guy knows this, uh, he's planning to buy this and you give that as gift and you ask him to pay uh, additional because I read your brain. So how ethical is it how ethical neuromarketing is actually there is a lot of neuromarketing which is happening in your uh, computer so you know it's not directly neuromarketing but it is very much near to that so if i just google and say i want to fly from bangalore to san francisco right today uh, so I'll just Google it. Then I decide, no, no, I'll go next month. Now it's COVID. I don't want to take any chances. So when I do the next, uh, as soon as I go home, it will again show me in Facebook or LinkedIn saying cheapest flights from Bangalore to San Francisco. It's again a kind of marketing. So I don't know what privacy we are talking about, but this is what is privacy about. Next is we also have lie detection. So many of the law are trying to use lie detection using no lie MRI. So can we use M fMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, to find out if a person is telling lie or not? Will it stand in the court of law? These are some of the ethical issues which is coming up. <coughs> and uh, there are a lot of legal issues, ethical issues, uh, privacy, uh, if somebody puts a virus on your computer, you have antivirus. But if somebody puts a brain saying he's trying to take something out of the brain, but he tried to put some virus, 
unknown virus uh, and he's trying to control your brain is that ethical so how long will this cognitive neuroscience neuroengineering brain computer interface will sustain is what uh, uh, we'll see so one thing is, is the question is this technology really ready for prime time or is it being abused so can you use the technologies especially brain related technologies uh, uh, how safe is this or how good it is uh, whenever we talk about brain computer interface acquiring signals and things like that of course we won't do it as a scientist but who knows anything can happen at any part of the time so with this i would like to stop uh, uh, the session of my presentation uh, you can write me email to abhishek.ml at bmsc.ac.in uh, i'll be happy to answer any questions over email or so this is my email ID. You can write to me. I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions. If you forget to copy also, you just Google Abhishek Apaji and you should be able to. You should be able to uh, talk to me as well as mail me. So let's take some of the questions. Uh, Pooja, is that OK? Uh, yeah, I was about to ask everyone. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yes. yeah, yeah you're you telling about your uh, research work like uh, bipolar disorder and uh, scriptomania and healthy volunteers. So all these are like, and uh, you start, you said like you ask four questions, it's something like uh, autism. Even in the case of an autism spectrum disorder, maximum will be going on with the questionnaire. Uh, and then we will be going on with some uh, non-invasive sort of uh, experiments, if I am right, like uh, brain cells, as you started alpha, beta. So all those things are there with the autism point of the view. So similarly, my question is, in this case, are we use the image data set or it is going to be like a text or open-ended or a closed-ended question answer types? So for autism, you are asking or? No, for your for your work because you have used a machine learning. You have said like you have used a machine learning. So yeah, my curiosity so, rise like why can't we use the deep learning? Right now we are more with the deep learning perspectives. Yeah. Using yeah. The CNN and all. So so I thought I, I want to knew like uh, what sort of data set are we used and where is uh, there is a scope for an extension for that. Yeah. So what I have done is I have taken uh, images, uh, you know, retinal images, and taken those features which I discussed in my presentation. Those features I fed to machine learning algorithm. So number of patients which I had, or number of eyes which I had, is say 300 people, 100 in bipolar, 100 in schizophrenia, and 100 healthy volunteers like us. Now each each patient or each healthy volunteer will have two eyes, so two images. So totally I had 600. Three groups, 200 each, 100 patients, two eyes, so 200 images. So I had 600 images. So that's why I ended up using machine learning. But I tried to use deep learning. It disastrously failed. It gave only 60%. And, uh, you know, deep learning really needs huge and huge amount of data. I mean, 600 is like zero for deep learning. You need at least you know, thousands of data, uh, at least a lakh or 60,000, 100,000 data. We can, we can multiply, it's not like we can multiply it. The same image which you have, we can uh, duplicate it n number of a times. Yeah, yeah, I tried that I, also. Yes, yeah, yes, so yes. I tried that yeah. also, pixelating it, all those things, but it really didn't work because uh, why it did work, I'll tell you. I mean, that is my guess, but that's that might be right. So why it didn't work? If you see the image of retina of a normal person versus somebody with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, it looks the same for an ophthalmologist, which means that the features what we are trying are the micro features which we are trying to extract. So those features are not very strong features unless it is extracted. So that's why it did, did not work. So I tried uh, replicating, I tried pixelating the images and then trying to see, uh, I tried various methods, but it didn't really work actually. But yeah, we are trying to acquire some more images for our new project, which we got fund on new year. So we'll be doing a lot of such works. So have you, have you tried with some other uh, related disease, like an autism for this retina or something like that? Retina of the autism related people. I mean, autism. no, so this psychiatry uh, is in. Uh, so if you see, you won't get any paper other than mine. Maybe recently, after my papers, uh, mine was the first of its kind which did uh, this kind of analysis. That's why I was able to publish in very good journals. But uh, 
otherwise there are traditionally what people do with retina is diabetic retinopathy which is very famous there is also um, uh, people do in uh, glaucoma macular degeneration those are very uh, diabetic retinopathy is beaten to death actually yeah, yeah, so there are all those papers will be with the retinopathy and all those yeah, yeah 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 so this is something new i want to do phd is something mm. a little novel right so but, when i did that i got said, uh, rightly like you are like supervisor was like, like a great uh, support for you that the yeah, clinical yeah, part of the video. we are yeah. very struggling lot with this clinical part actually when we try yeah. to do something we are not able to reach the correct person so mm. anyway all the best dr abhishek yeah, yeah. thank let's you let's keep in touch let's keep in touch yeah yeah sure ma'am please write yeah. an email yeah, sure, sure. so yeah, one yeah. more uh, advantage for my phd was my one of the supervisor was ophthalmologist another supervisor was physicist and uh, another supervisor was uh, uh, psychiatrist and then i had one more mentor who was an engineer uh, so, so this kind of combination and good thing is whenever it used to go pass through all the yeah whenever it used to go and pass through each of the supervisors they used to review and give comments so my paper usually the first go it used to get accepted that was the advantage of having so many supervisors disadvantage is uh, so many supervisors handling uh, uh one after the other so delay one supervisor used to take 10 days one of them five days one of them one week so that delay was a little bit but i really enjoyed my uh, phd journey given a choice i would do one more phd actually yeah any other questions before we close i guess we are having just five more minutes uh sir i have a query yes sir uh sir you were talking about the neuromarketing uh-huh so basically i was uh, going with the, some of the literature and some of the discussion with few of the psychologists uh-huh. so what we were uh, referring it to as ki as we, if you go with the brain signal say eeg and try to implement the neuromarketing concept mm-hmm. how feasible it is uh just by eeg i'm not sure if it will work at this point of time maybe advanced research maybe if you if you ask me the same question 5 or 10 years down the line it may work but right now is imaging what we are talking so his thought process about some particular thing that can bring uh, more of neuromarketing but again it's a privacy issue i don't know how many if you ask me what is happening in my brain you want to read i am not ready to actually do that and uh, sir one thing uh, i have a project sanctioned on F- fnirs setup that i am ah, using fnirs uh-huh. right so can we use or club this eeg and fnirs uh, both together to study the brain uh, function or uh, activation of brain areas yeah that's that's good idea sir i mean uh, see now nowadays the trend is multi modality if you just work on one single model especially neuroimaging or any other part so uh if you just use uh, one of them then uh, people the publications in good journals may be tough but if you are using multiple then please go ahead that's one of, i mean there is no harm in exploring so please uh, do that you are also from uh, uh, ltc sir uh no i am from birla institute of technology ranchi jharkhand okay ranchi okay okay that's good yeah okay thank you for the response sir yeah thank you sir thank you Okay, I done. I guess uh, we are done with uh, any yes. questions. But if you have any questions, please feel free to write me an email. I'll be happy to interact with you, collaborate, and so on and so forth. Thank you, thank you, Elvis. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir, much, sir, for uh, sharing this experience of your research. I think somebody is asking question. Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we can wind up, Pooja. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this experience. It it was really very informative, wonderful session it was. Especially uh the area of your PhD that is uh vascular dimension measurement and all uh, regarding retinal images and 
neuro marketing uh, aspects so we will look forward for more such session and uh, please share uh, share your contacts with the participants yeah yeah sure very easy way is you just google my name you'll get everything whatever you want you will get i request my... to share your ppts too sir ppts yeah, yeah sh sure sure A video i guess uh, the organizers will do presentation i'll share uh, share to all the yeah okay, and i am also attending yeah. few of the sessions uh, so it's going on really well the ftp is going on really well even the previous speaker was good it was more generic but it was really eye opening and uh, even tapan gandhi was good and even the first day inauguration i attend i att i'm attending few of the sessions so the workshop is going on really well congratulations to ldc biomedical department and all the organizers utkarsh thank you for inviting me thank you, sir. Thank you. yeah thank you okay then bye uh, bye sir have a good day thank you sir thank you bye